Hey, good morning, DEC members, and happy Monday to you all. I'm Steve Gregorian, CEO of the Detroit Economic Club, and it's a pleasure to have you with us today. I do want to take a brief moment to thank the 120 terrific DEC sponsors for their support of our mission, and you saw those companies while you were logging in. For today's meeting, we do ask that you mute your audio and video, and we do want you to use the chat room, however, for questions. And after we say goodbye to our guest at 1130, we invite you to stick around for 15 minutes and participate in structured networking with other DEC members, and that will conclude at 1145. It's a terrific way to meet some DEC members. Before we get started with the program today, though, I'd love to pay homage to the DEC's 86-year history, and I'd like to uh, share with you some speakers that have addressed the DEC on this day in our 86-year history. That list includes two presidents of General Motors, presidents of Michigan State University and Wade State Universities, the NASA Administrator, Reverend Jesse Jackson, and listen to this political A-list, Secretary of Defense, Dick Cheney, Secretary of Labor, Elizabeth Dole, Secretary of State, Dean Rusk, and our own Michigan Senator, Carl Levin. That's 13 in total on September 14th, and we are pleased to welcome our 14th speaker today. Our guest today was kind enough to visit us back in 2015 and was also scheduled to visit us in person this past April, but COVID-19 had a bit of a different idea. Bruce Van Son is chairman and CEO of Citizens Financial Group, a large regional bank with a significant presence in New England, the Mid-Atlantic and the Midwest, including right here in Michigan. And they serve more than 5 million consumer and business customers. In Bruce's 30 year financial career, he's held executive positions at RBS, Bank of New York Mellon, Deutsche Bank and Kidder Peabody. Bruce graduated summa cum laude with a degree in business administration from Bucknell University and also earned an MBA in finance and general management from the University of North Carolina. So he's a bison and a Tar Heel together. So Bruce, really great to see you again. Thanks so much for being with us today. Steve, it's my pleasure. Great to be here. Thanks. Let's jump right in and get started, Bruce. Lots to talk about and let's just take the bull by the horns here. So. Tell me, have the events and challenges of this year made you think differently about the role of a CEO and in particular, a bank CEO? Uh, I would say not really uh, differently, but certainly reinforce certain aspects of uh, being CEO. So CEO always needs to be uh, visible, a good communicator, uh, uh, provide strong leadership. But uh, what's happened this year is that we've spent a lot more time uh, having to make fast decisions. The crisis hit so quickly that uh, clock speed's been of a premium. And so really leveraging your team uh, has been extremely important. Uh, and, uh, and I think, you know, we've just basically risen to the occasion and been able to go with the flow and make strong decisions. Uh, in terms of banks, uh, banks play such an important role in the economy that, uh, you know, it really having an agenda focused on all our stakeholders what are we doing for customers uh, to help get them through, uh, making sure colleagues have a safe work environment, positively impacting our communities. I think that's always been part of the agenda, but we've actually uh, taken that to, to the next level during this crisis. Um, I don't think there's any question that there's gonna be some systemic changes in society coming out of the pandemic. Um, in your opinion, what lasting changes do you think will come out of it both for citizens and for your industry? Yeah, look, I think the first thing is that we've leaped forward in terms of uh, digital adoption and uh, customers' desire for self-service options. And so uh, we're probably three to five years forward uh, in terms of embracing that agenda. So uh, we were always seeing less foot traffic in the branches. We were always investing in our digital platforms, but. Uh, that's really going to accelerate. And so uh, that's going to be a big effort going forward is to really master that and, and do that well. Uh, what goes with that also is then we, we still need branches, but we can start to thin the branch network so we can afford those investments in digital uh, and basically reposition those branches as advice centers. Uh, so that means we have to upgrade the colleagues in the branches um, and, uh, and 
basically have people comfortable coming in to get that advice in person, which uh, we've seen good, good acceptance of that. Uh, and then lastly, um, I mentioned clock speed, just uh, working in new ways. We've moved into agile pods uh, so that all the change that happens in the bank is a cross section of both business people and technologists working together so we can innovate uh, and deliver for customers uh, much more quickly and more effectively. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, before I ask another question, I'm going to uh, remind our audience, we'd love to have some questions from you. You can just use the chat box and we're going to get to those in the last portion of our program today. So please, we do want to hear from you. So uh, uh, Bruce, uh, back to a couple of questions here. Um, what ramifications do you think the pandemic will have long term in the banking industry? And what about industry consolidation? and greater impact from non-bank players? Yeah. Well, I think any crisis really um, presents risks and opportunities. And so uh, to me, you have to uh, uh, seek the opportunities. Where do you have a right to win? Where can you innovate? Where you can, can you better position the bank? Uh, and the banks that are able to do that uh, will come out stronger than they came into the crisis. And so that uh, to me also involves uh, this digital agenda of uh, getting on the front foot and uh, really embracing that is important. I mentioned innovation. Uh, you know, we have to start thinking about uh, where are there opportunities that uh, allow us to have a right to win that we can meet some new needs uh, and uh, create some new revenue streams. We've done that in the past. We uh, innovated around uh, student loan refinancing. We innovated around point of sale financing with Apple as a big partner, and now we have Microsoft as a partner. So there's aspects like that, that uh, we have to place some bets and uh, prioritize our investments and then uh, really drive uh, uh, the agenda going forward from here. Um, I do think there's lots of competition uh, in banking, not just from other banks, but also from big techs coming into banking, fintechs coming into banking. Uh, and so it's uh, going to continue to be challenging to, 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 to stay successful and to keep your franchise strong and moving in the right direction. Uh, but the number one thing always is to take great care of your customers. And I think if we do that, uh, then the, our customers have no reason to, to switch to somebody who's uh, trying to come in and gain market share. I think it's a terrific strategy. Um, and so we're seeing banks, including yours, really digging in with all kinds of assistance for small businesses and individuals. Uh, how do and will banks need to act differently to help households and small businesses get back on their feet? I think, uh, Steve, it really boils down to advice. Uh, the, the, the ground that the banks wanna hold is to be the trusted advisor. Uh, for individuals, that's uh, a trusted advisor on their life's journey. Uh, for companies, it's basically fulfilling their aspirations and taking them through different uh, cycles, uh, different aspects of the business cycle. Uh, and so uh, when it comes to individuals, uh, giving them advice in terms of how to meet life's challenges, how to uh, invest appropriately for their needs, how to, how to borrow money when it's, uh, they're sending their kid to college or when they want to buy a vacation home. And so uh, all aspects of uh, uh, you know, their balance sheet and then their investment profile. Uh, if we do that well, that's, uh, I think, really adding value uh, and uh, will stand the test of time. I think on businesses, what, uh, what we found is, uh, you know, making sure they manage their liquidity well uh, and also that they have better tools to kind of look at their cash flow needs, uh, look at their expense base uh, and do uh, projections going forward, have better competitive information about how they stack up to peers. We're working on some uh, new platform that can offer those kind of tools for small businesses, which I think can also be distinctive and very helpful uh, to, to, to the smaller end of the company equation. Yeah, well, from a personal standpoint, uh, actually Detroit Economic Club standpoint, um, Rick and Citizens here is our banker, and I want to thank you and Rick and your team who uh, did a great job of leading us through the Triple P program back in the springtime. That was really well done and very helpful, so thank you. And I'm sure you guys have your hands full with, with all of that activity. Yeah, well, it's good to hear. Uh, we had uh, 
you know, over five billion of uh, loans we originated for over 45,000 borrowers positively impacted over half a million jobs through that program. So it was a real concerted effort on the part of the bank, uh, not without its uh, anxious moments, but uh, I feel really happy that we were able to deliver for our customers. Thank you. Um, let's talk a, a bit more local. Um, so local communities, local economies, they were already facing their share of challenges uh, when the pandemic emerged uh, back in the wintertime. And certainly the civil unrest that we've seen over the last several months has added another dimension to what we're all dealing with. How does Bruce Van Son see the role of a bank in terms of good corporate citizenship? Yeah. Well, I think uh, it starts with a, a, a commitment to diversity and inclusion uh, in terms of how we run our bank. And uh, uh, I think we've uh, uh, really always been held in high regard there. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the community is an important stakeholder lens. And so uh, we set objectives every year in terms of uh, you know, volunteerism. So we're at a you know, before the pandemic in 2019, we were about at 150,000 volunteer hours, uh, well over $15 million in contributions. And so really focusing on areas that we can make a difference in communities and uh, really help those communities where we live, work and play uh, thrive and help people reach their potential. So, uh, so we've always had that undercurrent, but this diversity inclusion, this we came out very uh, strongly with a statement uh, uh, promoting, uh, you know, social justice and, and racial equity. Uh, we put our money where our mouth is. So we put $10 million up to go into uh, different uh, programs, small business grants for minority owned businesses, uh, uh, different training inside the company, uh, grants to different organizations uh, uh, that help uh, people of color. So uh, feel, feel good about that. We've also uh, committed another half a billion dollars above our normal CRA targets for low and moderate income communities that will promote housing uh, and entrepreneurial opportunities uh, for, for those smaller businesses. So uh, feel good about that. And, and that's one of the nice things about banking, Steve, over a long career in banking. It's a, I view it as a noble profession where we you know, impact people, touch people's lives, touch communities. Uh, and that's one of the reasons it's always great to get up in the morning and come to a job where you have the opportunity to do that. Love to hear that, and you, and you guys do put your literally money where your mouth is, so thank you for doing that. Um, Bruce, uh, as this pandemic situation unfolded, um, what has surprised you, pleasantly or not so pleasantly? Uh, I'd say uh, most of it's pleasant, actually. So I think the way our colleagues inside the bank uh, really rose to the occasion to take care of customers uh, was was very satisfying to see. Uh, and then how our leadership team actually uh, was able to step up and make a lot of decisions in very challenging circumstances and for the most part, always good decisions. So uh, inside the company, I think we, we really stepped up uh, to the plate. Uh, I'm also pleased with how uh, the federal government uh, was able to put together the CARES Act and really provide stimulus to help people uh, get through this uh, very tough period. And then the Federal Reserve Bank uh, really uh, stepped up to the plate and used their playbook from the Great Recession, but then also put some new plays into the playbook and had a tremendously positive impact. Uh, and the net result of that, you can see everybody thought uh, there'd be a slower recovery. We wouldn't get uh, below double digit unemployment uh, to the end of the year. And we've already hit 8.4% in August, which is really uh, terrific to see that. I'd say the only thing that uh, is negative is that uh, there's just still too much politicking and partisanship over the whole uh, pandemic and recovery. It's like, uh, uh, you know, we should all be looking for common solutions in my views. So that's the only thing that uh, I'd say has been a little disappointing. Thank you. Um, do you have an opinion on uh, uh, whether we'll see another stimulus program from the government? Uh, I think it's it, uh, it's appropriate to do something. Um, I know the bid ask between what the Dems would like and what the Republicans think is appropriate is pretty wide. But uh, you know the economy is not completely out of the woods, and there's still people and businesses that are hurting. So I think getting something that's a compromise position would be great to see. And then one last uh, uh, leadership 
question before I turn it over to Rick and I'll remind uh, our members um, on the Zoom here, we'd love to hear from you. We've got a couple questions, but we would love to hear some more questions from you. So uh, in terms of uh, your leadership style, um, did you learn anything differently in terms of your style going through the whole pandemic that we've gone through? Um, I would say uh, that there's probably two things that I've always uh, focused on, but one is to empower the team more. So, uh, you know, I just think you, you, in, a, in a fast moving environment, uh, it really pays to have invested in your team and put good people around you that ha you have confidence in. And so, uh, you know, that was really, uh, there was no choice, but to really invest in, uh, just vest them with the authority to make decisions. So. Uh, that was one. And then I say the second thing is just uh, the importance of communication, doing calls like this. I mean, we've had uh, employee town halls with 7,000 people on the line, and uh, I've had many other smaller group interactions, but uh, you just push the boundaries of how do you communicate effectively and make sure people are aligned. And, uh, you know, and, and I say the, 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 the twin aspect of that is you've got to be a better listener. So, uh, you know, you want to you know, show empathy for people, hear how they're doing, take the time just to talk to people as people, which I think in normal times, maybe we didn't do as much, but I think that's also resonated really well uh, with folks. And it's something that we should try to keep with us when we get back to, to normal times. Yeah, thanks for your transparency on that. So you ready to take on some audience questions, Bruce? Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well. Then at this point, I'd like to turn this over to DEC board member Rick Hampson, who is the president of Citizens Bank Michigan and a terrific supporter of the Detroit Economic Club. Thanks for being with us, Rick, and it's all yours. Sounds good, Steve. Thank you. Um, great to be here. And Bruce, uh, very nice to see you. On behalf of the Michigan team, it's um, really appreciate you being here and um, being with us. So I'll jump into some questions that have come in. Um, First one, um, how has the banking industry handled the current recession as opposed to the one a decade ago? Well, what's different really, Rick, is uh, this time around, uh, banks are uh, part of the solution as a part of the problem. So, uh, you know, we spent uh, the greater part of a decade after the Great Recession in just strengthening our balance sheet, uh, improving our culture to really be customer oriented. Uh, and so, when this uh, latest uh, pandemic hit and caused the recession, banks were in a great position to actually work with customers, use our balance sheet, had a huge amount of line draws, as you know, uh, the PPP program. So uh, really in a position to be helpful. And I think that's been well recognized by you know, the whole country basically. And the key people down in Washington are very pleased to see that uh, banks have been uh, uh, able, willing and able to step up to the plate. Perfect. Thank you. Um, how about this one? Um, how is citizens handling the return to office? And will there be some, in some capacity, a work from home that'll be permanent, do you think, for, for banks? Yeah, I, I do think that um, it's, it's been remarkable how effective uh, companies have been with a, with a work from home strategy. Uh, I worry a little bit that it's not necessarily sustainable and you lose some of the benefits of being in an office setting. Uh, you know, there's uh, ability to collaborate and uh, build your culture and mentor young people. Many, many reasons that uh, office settings have been popular and have been the norm uh, for years. Uh, we have, uh, have a, built a, a three phase return to office program. So. Uh, we always had essential colleagues, about 7,000, and then we had about 11,000 who were working remotely. Um, and so phase one for the return to office for those folks was uh, to invite them to come back in. Uh, we just start today with phase two, which is we encourage them uh, to come back in. And we said that'll last for at least three months. And then after that, it'll be mandatory that, that folks come back in. But uh, my view has been, uh, you have to go slow on this. There's many legitimate reasons that people uh, can't come into the office or it's suboptimal for them to come into the office. Uh, phase one, we've probably been about 20% of our staff uh, has through the invitation phase has been in the office. 
I think that'll go to 40 to 50% during this encouragement phase. Uh, and that's fine for now. The folks who, who can't make it in, uh, I hope they uh, continue to work effectively remotely and I think they will be able to do that. Got it. Yep, thank you, Bruce. Um, you touched on this one a little bit, but um, are there simply too many banks? Uh, it seems like new banks pop up all the time. Thoughts on banks, and you touched on even fintechs and other competitors, but thoughts on are there too many banks here? Well, you know, if you look back 25 years ago, we, we had three times the number of banks we have today. So it still seems like there's a lot of banks, but uh, this, is a, this is a country with lots and lots of small banks. Uh, I think we've gone from about 15,000 plus banks to about 5,000 today. I think there's still room for consolidation. Uh, what you're seeing though is that, uh, you know, there's still entrepreneurial folks who see niches to form new banks. Uh, you're seeing uh, big companies decide to open branches as part of a complement to their digital strategies. Folks like Chase often opening branches in new cities while they're uh, thinning out in places where they're already thick. Uh, so I do think uh, you'll, you'll continue to see uh, a, a decline over time in banks, but I think branches will continue to be an uh, important uh, part of the banking landscape. Got it. Thank you. Um, this one's more kind of on the personal level. I know I've traveled with you here and there, and I know you've got, you know, kind of a workout routine or things, but specifically uh, the question is, how have you personally handled the stresses that have come from this situation? Any advice from maybe the group? Yeah. Well, um, I'm, I've always uh, had the mantra of kind of work hard, play hard. So uh, you, you put in a lot of hours at the office and uh, you need to, to uh, kind of offload that stress by having some hobbies and things. And so, uh, you know, just, just swimming is a big form of exercise for me, but I played a lot of golf and played a lot of tennis when I can squeeze it in. Uh, so, and then, uh, you know, long, uh, long uh, frequent uh, dog walks too, when everything was shut down, that was a, a form of exercise. But uh, in any case, just, just making sure you have that balance, making sure you're surrounding yourselves with friends and family. We had uh, two of our adult children basically living with us for the last six months, which also just an opportunity to do things with them and get closer to them. So, uh, you know, you just have to kind of go with the flow, try to keep things in balance and uh, take the longer term perspective to, to just keep yourself in good uh, physical and mental health. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, and, and you just touched on it really. There's some positives like, you know, having your kids at home, that's, um, you might not have had that opportunity, but yet this, um, the pandemic kind of put it at you and you enjoyed it. So yep. that's great. Um, number of questions around the local bank branch. So you touched on it a bit, but I think the question, if I summarize some of the questions, you know, in the long term, um, how will the responsibilities and roles that the local bank uh, branch will play in the banking system? Yeah, well, what's been really interesting to see, Rick, is that over time, the, the, the kind of nature and role of branches uh, has changed. And, uh, uh, and so they used to be really where you would stand up and cash your paychecks on Friday and then uh, we moved to automated deposits. We moved to ATM machines. You could get cash out and enhanced ATMs to take deposits. Uh, and so now you can stay at home and you can make a deposit by taking a picture on your smartphone. So most of the transaction flow has been automated away from a need to go in and interact with a person in the branch. And those branches, uh, as I said earlier, become more advice centers where uh, you can go in and set an appointment and talk to somebody about a real need you have. Um, and so I think you'll continue to see that uh, trend evolve. Um, and I think it's, it's, uh, it's good. I think the folks, our most satisfied customers use all points of, dis of our distribution. They come into our branches, they uh, op active on our digital platform, they call our contact center. Uh, and so when we do our customer SAT surveys, uh, those are the most satisfied customers because they think it works seamlessly together and it gives them choice. And so uh, empowering your customers, you see that in other industries, you see how the airlines allow you to book your own tickets and not have to interact and not wait online and you can print them out yourself or put it right on your phone and go up to the counter. I mean, that's where banking has to get to where we've empowered our customers uh, and they can choose how they want to interact with us and it's all seamless. Got it. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard you say that a number of times that they want to have all those at, those ways to access and 
whatever's convenient for them at that time, that's what they're going to want to use. So it's critical but to the, have all. The trick is to make sure you're making a profit doing that. So you can't, you can't give them everything. They'd like to have it all and not pay too much for it. And so uh, basically uh, figuring out how to thin some of that physical distribution so you can afford the investments in the new digital platforms. That's a nice equation that we have to get right. Yeah, got it. Um, all right, Bruce, this one, um, what do you see as the primary drivers for growth for Citizens Bank and maybe the industry overall? And then what might be the impediments to achieving that, that growth or that success? Yeah, I, I, I think the, uh, the, the, the challenge right now is that uh, the Fed is operating in a, uh, a zero rate environment and the back end of the curve is now 75 basis points, which the last time we were in a low rate environment, uh, the back end of the curve was generally 175 to two and a quarter. And so you had a steeper yield curve, which is more conducive for, for banks making spread income. Uh, so that's going to be the challenge over the next couple of years. Uh, I think to, to combat that, uh, the, 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 the key thing is to really deepen those relationships with your customers, uh, keep uh, investing in your uh, service capabilities. You know, we bought fee businesses. We bought a wealth management shop. We bought a mortgage business on the consumer side. We bought some M and A boutiques on the commercial side. We want to do more for our customers and really, you know, help them. Uh, and and uh, and uh, in effect, as we do more, we generate more revenues for the bank. And so, I think in an environment where spread income is going to be a little harder to come by. Uh, capture more wallet share, do more for your customers, and then really work on that cost equation is to, you know, uh, move to digital, uh, take out uh, costs of the old way of doing business, uh, and just streamline, become more efficient while you're delivering uh, better customer experience. And then lastly, it's just some of the things I mentioned, you got to find the running room, where do I lend money profitably, find good risk adjusted returns, where do I innovate? Can I find another student loan refi? Can I find another uh, point of sale type uh, opportunity where I can keep my top line growing? Because as everybody here on this call knows, uh, if you're growing your revenues, life's a lot easier <laughs> than if you're contracting revenues. And so uh, that'll be a big push for the industry. Got it. Thank you. And you touched on, uh, there was a lot of questions kind of come in around digital and you really touched on that a few times here. So I think we have time for maybe one more. Um, the, this question came in, do you think banks are doing enough around cybersecurity to kind of protect individuals and, and companies? Yeah, look, um, that every year goes right to the top of the uh, kind of capital expenditure sorting that we do when we, when we set our priorities, but uh, protect the bank is what we call that category. Uh, and uh, all those things about protecting data, protecting assets uh, 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 around uh, the customer uh, is critically important. And uh, folks need to rely on their banks that they can uh, sustain and protect uh, all of that, the, 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 their personal information, their assets. Um, and, and that's been a role. I mean, you think back years ago, uh, the, the bank that you wanted your money in had the biggest uh, brick walls and the biggest safe. And so there was a physical aspect to why I trust that bank. You look at today, it's really who's got the best uh, cyber uh, uh, professionals who, uh, and technologists who are able to figure out how to create that same sense of security uh, around, uh, around uh, the customer assets. And so, uh, you know, we will never short the pot on that. Uh, but having said that, there are lots and lots of bad people out there, lots of bad actors down there. And it's, it's like a, a cat and mouse game. You know, we close a door and then they try to come in through a window and then we have to quick uh, close those windows and try to anticipate what they're going to do next. There's some really good information sharing uh, with other banks and with the government about the techniques that are being deployed around the world to try to uh, you know, penetrate the banks and to uh, exfiltrate assets, but uh, I think so far the industry's done a really good job of, uh, of keeping up with that, and I think we will continue to do so going forward, given the importance that we place on that. Yep. Excellent. Thank you. So, um, Bruce, Steve, I think I'm going to uh, kick it back to Steve. Thank you uh, for letting me be here. Good job, Rick. Thank you, Rick.
terrific job. Just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, of course, I'd like to thank the Citizens Bank team and my team for their work on today's program. A huge, huge thank you to Bruce for your insights and time. Thanks to Rick Hampson for your role in today's virtual meeting. Uh, Bruce, we certainly hope that uh, we can see you here in Michigan uh, in person at a DEC event sometime when it's safe to do so. So thanks again for your time, Bruce. I, I would love to do that, Steve. Uh, I hope this was uh, the next best thing, but it's always great to be in person. I look forward to that. Thank you and goodbye to Bruce and to Rick. Have a Thanks. great week.